welcome to another edition of the NCBI podcast. I'm June Tinsley, Head of Communications and Advocacy with NCBI. And today I have the pleasure of having a chat with Anya Sullivan, um, who is a, has a quite a diverse background, who's happy to share with us, um, who has spent a fair amount of time in Germany, um, but also in, in Ireland as well. So um, thank you, Anya, for taking the time to have a chat with me and uh, welcome aboard. Hi, yeah, thank you for having me on your show. Um, yeah. Great, great. Well, I suppose just to, to kick off, I, I ask all my guests to um, tell us a little bit about yourself. All right, so as you said, my name's Anya. I'm a 26-year-old student at the Royal Irish Academy of Music in Dublin, um, which is affiliated with Trinity. So uh, I get the perks of Trinity, like the gym and different societies, but... Uh, my heart is really with music um, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate because it's one of the things that keeps uh, humans all together and something everyone can bond over no matter what the language is. True, um, true. And uh, I suppose other things about me, I even though I have very, very little vision, I have Stargardt's disease. Um, I was diagnosed in 2015 initially with a different disorder, Conrad dystrophy, but then in 2020, I got the genetic test confirmation that it was actually Stargardt's disease. Um, and ever since, my life has changed a lot, I suppose, um, because I have the security of knowing my diagnose and uh, decided to keep going at things that I love rather than letting a diagnose, you know, rule your life uh, and kept doing the things that I used to love before the diagnose. And I still do art. Uh, it takes probably 10 times longer, if not more. I still read. I have to take a nap every 20 minutes, but look, it's what you enjoy uh, that you should keep doing. True, very true. Um, and has your vision deteriorated since 2015 or has it stayed the same? So uh, I was still living in Germany at the time. I grew up in Germany till I was 14. Parents are both Irish, but uh, when I moved to Ireland, I finished secondary school, moved back to Germany straight after the leaving cert, where I got my diagnose with the eyes. And in Germany, they don't give you like the what they say in Ireland, like six out of 60 is what they say now or less um, yes. is what they say in Ireland. But in Germany, they gave it in per percentages. So in 2015, I still had literally just 50 percent so it's just the legal aid a uh, legal limit to be allowed to do driver's license and stuff um but obviously that was a detrimental time um I just finished leaving sort of six months later and I got that diagnosed and I thought god damn like what what are you going to do because I planned on doing interior design and maybe do like a minor in music or something there was a course in Holland that offered that and that no longer was an option and um, I had a lot of stress in my personal life um, within family and relationship. And it my my vision deteriorated very, very quickly from 50 down to 5%. Um, wow. So that, that was kind of the hard part um, because you literally see things disappear in front of you. Not completely. They just become blurry. But you you think you're fine and your body adapts so amazingly like it's, it's amazing what the human body can do like I have five percent vision but I still get around fine I have perfect peripheral vision but what Stargardt's disease does it takes your central vision okay and um what it does it attacks the center of your retina and you have all the cones and rods most densely populated in that area so if you're missing the cells that take in the image that then send it to the brain you can't exactly do anything and glasses don't help and it's one of those like invisible disabilities yes. that no one understands and then glasses don't help and everyone's like oh why don't you just wear glasses when they see you like stare at your screen about an inch away um yes yes, yes. And for me I I noticed my eyesight getting worse when um for example I couldn't read the the sign above the bus stops anymore to see what time the next bus is going to be there or um in the cinema I wouldn't be able to read subtitles anymore and it was just it wasn't really 
consciously noticing it. It was just from one day to the other, I'd be like, oh, I can no longer see that. And sometimes I was like, oh, grand, well, I'll just get on with it. But sometimes obviously you'll, you'll get emotional as well. And um, and frustrated, I'm sure as well. Yeah. Oh, frustrated is the, the worst one, especially if you're on your own and you're traveling and people are not being helpful and you're trying to explain what the situation is and they just don't have the time to to listen or to to just help you for like two seconds but look everyone has their problems and um I am so enormously grateful that I can still get around there are people that have it so much worse um so like I try to attack it that way I don't like to think of it as being something that'll stop me from doing things it makes me more human I suppose we all have our imperfections true true and as you say it's uh you're focusing on your hobbies and skills and talents and um, music is is definitely one of those talents so tell us a little bit more about being an operatic singer (laughs) oh I'm not sure if I'd call myself an operatic singer just yet Um, (laughs) I am I am studying music performance and the focus is on uh, classical singing so I I do the whole like no microphone big voice thing we all have to for example we have to wear like fancy dresses or suits or we have to get dressed up dolled up um <laughs> but like I I love singing it's something I'm good at um I never thought necessarily that I'd make a career out of it and I don't think like I enjoy performing but I don't want it to be like my life I wouldn't want it to be audition after audition and hope pray that I'll get in I'd rather share my music and share my talent, be able to teach people how to use their voice, how to be able to sing without damaging their voice. Um, Because I'm a big advocate for um, making sure you don't sing through your nose or through your throat and sing in a way that is uh, sustainable. Yes. yes. Like your whole life. We have some teachers in our school that are over the age of 80. We had um, Ronnie Dunn, Veronica Dunn, who sadly passed away uh, was it last last year now? Um, but she was teaching up into her nineties and still able to sing. Like it's just that's phenomenal, incredible. Um, so yeah, I that that's what gets me going. Being able to share my music and being able to give other people their voice. So that's kind of what I'm hoping to do after the bachelor degree. Do maybe a master's in music therapy because I didn't know it existed. Yes. Um, being able and to is, help. Is music therapy um, a viable option uh, in Ireland? Has it expanded much in recent years? So uh, the University of Limerick is now offering a course in it and it's been very, very, very successful. Um, one of the lecturers in my college, uh, some of her friends have done the course and she was just complimenting it so much. Uh, her, her name was Dr. Sophie Lee. And um it just inspired me so much. I I just when I read about it and heard about it, I just thought, yeah, that's that's, that's exactly what I want to do. Whereas when I decided to go for the music performance degree, it was kind of like a okay, you've been given this diagnose. Then it was literally the day that I found out that it's Stargardt's disease and not Conrad dystrophy, the day I got my gene, gene test results in the middle of COVID. Um but that was the same day I found out I got accepted into the Royal Irish Academy. And um, busy day, mixed emotions on that day. <laughs> very, very busy day. Um, and I was so excited. It was the first time that, you know, like professionals had said, oh, you actually really can sing and you have a talent. Um, but it was never something that, like I said, that I thought I'd want to make a career as performing, but more for teaching. And um so when I found out about the music therapy, then that just kind of solidified. And it was the first time I was like, now I know exactly what I want to do. Here's an option. It seems kind of the best out of a bad situation, but this is what I would love to do. So it was pretty cool finding that yeah. out. Yeah, you certainly seem to be on the, the right path to get there. So that sounds exciting, which is great. Okay. Yeah. Um, and also, um, I believe you were a, a previous Rosa Tralee contestant. Is that right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was, when oh, was that and how was that? Oh, I, Rosa Trilly is 
a phenomenal experience. It's so, so much fun. Uh, I Brilliant. had the honor of representing Germany back in 2017, five year anniversary this year. <laughs> um, and it'll actually be my first time returning to the festival, not as a rose, um, okay. which will be exciting this year. But now like the amount of people you meet, the diversity of people you meet, um, and that strong Irish connection from across the globe. Uh, it's just, I can't quite describe the feeling of being part of it because it's just, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel real. It, the whole, we were there for 10 days, 11 days, and it flew by in a second. Um, we just had so much fun. All the roses were so lovely. Um, we had a we were the only year to have a Hong Kong rose Clarissa who was just so so much fun to hang around with and to, to speak to like there's girls working in all sorts of different career uh, all sorts of different careers and they all have their own um problems that they've had to deal with as well and it was just such a bonding experience and are you still uh, in touch with some of them yeah yeah I am uh one of the girls, Donny Gall Rose, um, whose room was right opposite mine, together with the San Francisco Rose, they were kind of like the two girls that I hung out with the most, Amanda and uh, Amy. And Amy now has two beautiful twin girls, but oh. herself and I, we we bonded so much over music because she loves musical theatre and dance, and she studied dance up in Derry, I believe. Um, so we try to stay in touch over Instagram, but since she's had her kids, she obviously doesn't have as much time as you can imagine with yes. twins. Like having one kid is a lot of work, but two is a lot. Two more. at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, the escorts, I'd be in a lot of uh, contact with some of them as well. One of one of them just moved to Boston and got engaged to another Rose from 2014. Like it's just, it's it's such a lovely network um i myself i'm actually dating uh, a 2019 escort uh, <laughs> the, the tentacles of the um oh, festival yeah it's so very far and wide it's it's mad like i know that we always say that the world is such a small place but truly rosa truly really seems to have connections everywhere like when i got my flight from dusseldorf over to uh was it, I think I flew into Cork. Yeah, I flew into Cork for the Rose Trilly. And um, we were all supposed to do like a little bit of social media stuff. So I asked the stewardesses and the pilot if there was any chance I could get a, a photo with them wearing the sash kind of to Promotion, show like yeah. my arrival into Ireland. And uh, turns out the co-pilot was the son of the 1973 Rose of Trilly who had married her escort. Oh, so, yeah. That's mad brilliant. absolutely <laughs> mad uh but very very cool <laughs> and everyone is always invited to come to all sorts of events doesn't matter if you're wilted rose once you hand over your sash you wilt but <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a, a, a strange word a horrible <laughs> word really wilted rose um, I think we uh, all kind of like the expression we don't see it as a bad thing we're kind of honored <laughs> to be wilted rose because we get to pass on our wisdom but no yes. like it it really people think it's like a beauty pageant but it it really is not it's all about uh personality how you present yourself in front of a big group of people how you can speak in public and just how you feel about your homeland like how you feel about your country about the area you're representing yes. um, because it is all about just the, the Irish connections around the world and to make sure that the Irish community always stays uh, a welcoming place. It, it genuinely is an, an intriguing festival because it's obviously lasted 50 or 60 years um, and it'll be happening again this year for the first time in person uh, since 2019. So yeah. it's, um, it, it's, it's a phenomenal initiative that, as you say, has um, networks right across the globe. Yeah. It's fabulous, it, I think. And, it really uh, does. Which rose won in the year you participated? Oh, it was Jennifer Byrne or Offaly Rose. Uh, okay. I believe she was the first Offaly Rose to ever win it as well. Okay. Fair play to her. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. 
Um, and you, you mentioned to me um, off air about being um, another hobby of yours is is rowing. And how did you get involved yeah. in that? And has that um, with Sturgarts, has, has you had to amend how you participate <laughs> in rowing? I suppose, well, um, I started rowing back when I was 15, 15, 16 uh, in Bantry. Um, when I'd moved over to Ireland with my mother and my little sister, we moved back to my mum's hometown. And um, my grandmother's house happens to be right in front of Reen Dunnigan Lake, which is the lake the Bantry Club row on. And my mum used to row when she was a teenager. So she'd always told me loads about it and how much fun it is. And also whenever we went to visit granny, we'd see the rowers on the lake. And I just thought, oh, that'd be so much fun to do. So I decided to try it out and um, loved it. Never got to compete though back then. Um, there's this whole weird thing where the lake broke and it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but it genuinely did. There is a <laughs> tiny bit of land just between the ocean and the lake. And during a very high tide, the land broke and um, uh, the, the land barrier broke. And it, now we had a tidal lake where oh, the boats could no longer be uh, put into the water from the slip um, and the the ground of the lake was like quicksand but in mud form oh, and we tried yeah. for a few weeks months but it was just uh, too dangerous like people were sinking while yeah. carrying the boats and it was awkward. Lethal. yeah and it was awkward getting training times as well because obviously the tide changes every day so okay. we sadly I had to give it up then and when I moved up to Dublin um I loved college I love music still but I felt like I needed some sort of different escape and so I signed up with the Trinity Rowing Club the DULBC Dublin University Ladies Boat Club mm -hmm. and um have been so welcome there they're so lovely and it was just crazy like I started there and the coach said like oh yeah this year we have a, an Olympian with us in the club and I was like wait what um lovely Afrikyo who actually just came uh third in the world championships in the Coxus four out in Poland last weekend yeah and like those girls have just been so supportive and rowing is one of the sports where you don't need to be able to see um you just can't be the person steering <laughs> if you're in a club if yes. you're in a coxes boat and for people who don't know who the cox is the cox is a person who sits in the boat they usually have to be quite small because you have to fit in this tiny little hole and they command you around and they steer the boat um but they're absolutely vital for competitions they keep you motivated because believe me after the first 500 meters in a two kilometer race you just want to give up like your body's telling you stop doing this to yourself but it's too much hard work <laughs> <laughs> exactly but no it's it's so, so much fun. And it's one of those sports where it's team bonding, but because you don't need to be able to see, like you can just listen. You can listen to the person sliding up in front of you because the, the, the seats aren't, um, they, they can move. Um, yes. So you listen out for that. You listen out for the, like I, I like to call it the vroom, when you take your stroke and everyone's at the exact same time and they, they turn their oars around and it's that like always one noise and it's so satisfying um and also like you you get really ripped just going to training yeah um, how, how many people are in your boat and um, well I'm racing in the Cork Regatta this weekend and I'm racing in two different boats I'm rowing in a uh coxed eight and a coxed four um okay. so we okay. always only have one oar um, rather than the sculling where we have two oars um, but yeah it, it'll be fun I, I look forward to it we just got back from London a few weeks ago we got to row in the London Met in the same boat the four that I'm rowing in this weekend and our goal was not to come last and we came third last and it was the most satisfying feel like we were on such a high and we still are <laughs> congratulations <laughs> yeah like you have to you have to take your battles and for us our boat uh, it's she's just as old as me she's 26 years old and um <laughs> the steering broke three times in like two days and it was just it wasn't great so for us not to come last like 
that was a huge achievement in a boat that wasn't working as well as we would like it to and you obviously Um, have to bring the boat with you to London yeah yeah our coach was very good and decided to make the long journey with the trailer to take a ferry and drive over yeah fabulous fabulous and will that be the same boat that you're participating in in Cork yes well well, best of luck with it It sounds very exciting it's it's been fixed since um we'll just hope it doesn't break again (laughs) fingers crossed fingers crossed Um, and tell me, uh, Oni, just to, to conclude our chat here, um, do you have any one piece of advice that you'd give to uh, another person who's just been diagnosed with a, a sight loss condition? Yeah, I, I suppose this is obviously a hard question because everyone will take it a different way. True. But um, for me, it was, I'd say, like, let it sink in. Don't pretend like, ah, oh, it's grand. It might be grand in a while, but you have to let that information sink in and deal with it. Talk to your friends and family. Don't bottle things up and focus on the things that you love to do and that you are good at doing because you'll always be good at them, no matter how much your eyesight deteriorates. Very wise words. uh, And it certainly seems to be what has uh, motivated you and uh, made you achieve so much. Um, so well, I, I wish you all the best in your future career in, in music therapy best of luck on Saturday in the race and um, thank thanks you. for sharing all your experiences it's been a pleasure talking to you thank you very much for having me and as always if any of our listeners wishes to get in touch with our um, services they can be accessed through our website ncbi.ie or by calling the info line one 800 911 250